Okay, we're back. Um, during the pandemic, Stan and I would um, take a break from the traditional sermon format and do kind of a conversation about uh, scripture or a topic. And so we thought we'd try and do it live. It seems cool, we're just like you're doing a podcast, but we'll see what it's like doing live. You can give us your feedback. Um, but so this is Stan, he's one of the pastors here at Westlight. And again, I'm Lori. And um, Stan, I just wanted to thank you so much for bringing contact to Westlight. <laughs> this is kind of his baby. And um, I had this has been two sermons and two weeks of reflections, but it's been really powerful for me personally. So thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. So um, God loves us with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so for the next four weeks, we'll be talking about that. And I don't know why we decided to do it backwards. <laughs> so today, Stan and I are going to talk about strength. And Stan talks a lot about how strength has to do with our volition and our will. And the Apostle Paul talks about that in Ephesians um, 6, 10 through 18. So we'll get us started and read the passage. Now, my beloved ones, I have saved these most important truths for last. Be supernaturally infused with strength through your life union with the Lord Jesus Christ. Stand victorious with the force of his explosive power flowing in and through you. Put on God's complete set of armor provided for us so that you will be protected as you fight against the evil strategies of the accuser. Your hand-to-hand -hand combat is not with human beings, but with the highest principalities and authorities operating in rebellion under the heavenly realms. For they are a powerful class of demon gods and evil spirits that hold this dark world in bondage. Because of this, you must wear all the armor that God provides so you're protected as you confront the slanderer. For you are destined for all things and will rise victorious. Put on truth as a belt to strengthen you to stand in triumph. Put on holiness as protective armor that covers your heart. Stand on your feet alert, then you'll always be ready to share the blessings of peace. And in every battle, take faith as your wraparound shield, for it is able to extinguish the blazing arrows coming, arrows coming at you <coughs> from the evil one. Embrace the power of salvation's full deliverance like a helmet to protect your thoughts from lies. And take the mighty razor-sharp spirit sword of the spoken word of God and pray passionately in the spirit as you constantly intercede with every form of prayer at all times and pray the blessings of God upon all of his believers. So I love Paul's tone. He's like, we got to go to war on this, right? But um, the first few verses talk a lot about the enemy and the evil strategy. So Stan, can you please unpack that for us? <laughs> sure. Uh if you remember the favorite book of my son-in-law, Cots, is Genesis. In the Genesis story, the first uh, fall, well, the fall is initiated with disobedience. And what the disobedience talks about is basically trying to create a division in relationship, a division between God and the person and also between the man and the woman because that's what happened when the fall occurred was a division was created and that has always been the strategy of the enemy uh, because he knows that in relationship in in good contact is strength is power is is victory so he will do everything he can to create the idea that we are alone or that what we face will overcome us, that we are inadequate. And so what Paul is emphasizing, because he says the most important truth is this, is that God is for us and not against us. And in fact, it's not just words of encouragement, but in actuality, he wants to infuse us with his spirit. And so our will and his will move in the same direction. So we're moving together as he, God always intended it to be. 
God did not place us on this earth to figure it out by ourselves. He placed us on this earth to say, let's discover this together. Let's join together. And in that way, we can find victory, we can find freedom, and ultimately, we can find what, what we were meant to be and, and to enjoy. And so I believe that um, our struggles are never to be alone. They are to be shared, first with God, but also with each other, because that's the way God intended us to overcome these things, not through your own self-determination. The self-determination is to decide that you're going to do it God's way and not yours. That's where you need to, no one can make you do that. God will not make you do that. But sometimes to come to that point of decision is where we need other people to encourage us and to have these relationships. So that's what I think the emphasis here is on in the, in the first portion of this scripture is on relationship, is that our struggle is not on things seen but on, on the unseen. And the unseen represents relationship. And that is what I believe the rest of this passage also talks about. So. I'm, glad you, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. And I think for me personally, like the times when it's been the hardest are the times when I feel alone. And I feel like no one else is going through this. And it's very dark. And I, I love that you said that that's not how God designed us to be or how we were meant to, to be and to live in this world. Um, so I, I, need my, <laughs> I need my tagline so I help me remember. But I think like what you're saying is, or what the Apostle Paul is saying is that our desire for independence, right? We're so, we love self-reliance. We want to be self-sufficient. But that is so, that's what draws, that's like playing into the hands of the enemy. Like he wants us to be independent and go through our struggles alone. So our desire for interdependence, it has to be stronger. It must be stronger than our desire for independence. And even though I love independence and that desire is strong, in my mind, if we were going to go to war on this, then it has to, our desire for interdependence has to be stronger than our desire for, for independence. Um, because, yeah. We want to be, I, you know, I do this all the time. Like I go through something and then I'll tell you after I go through it, but I didn't ask for help or anything while I'm going through it. And, and we're just so, we don't want to bother people or we don't want to, um, you know, it's, it's hard to ask to share what we need or, or we're going through a struggle. So um, can you talk to us more about the armor of God? So, uh, I'm sure you've heard sermons on this, or you, you probably will continue to hear sermons on these individual pieces. And oftentimes the emphasis is on the individual. But in the context of this, Paul's just talked about, as Lori said, a, a war. And a soldier did not fight like Rambo in those days. A soldier fought together with other soldiers. So actually, I believe the pieces of the armor of God also relate to this, what Gloria talked about, this interdependence and where we need to see each other as interdependent on each other. So we can start with the belt of truth, right? And the belt of, of truth, to me, the, the character of truth is to be authentic, genuine, and honest. And so in our relationship, in order to hold it together, like a belt does, there has to be honesty, authenticity, and basically dealing with reality. Not making up stuff that we imagine or that we, we want other people to think is happening, but to be truly honest and forthright. So the first part of a relationship with God and a relationship with each other is truth, because that's what binds us together. The next piece is called the breastplate of righteousness, or in, in the uh, Passion, it talked about, excuse me, it talked about a um, holiness. And 
I, righteousness and holiness are very similar terms. And what it means is that we are connected up. So in other words, what we are communicating, we're in right relationship with the other person on. And so we have this, this ability to uh, get down to a heart-to-heart -heart conversation where we both see each other. And that's why it's a breastplate of righteousness because the breastplate covers the heart and all these internal organs, right? And so in, in our very inner core, in our very being, that we are in right relationship with one another. So we aren't, we aren't trying to hide our inner core from God because he already knows. And he would be encouraging us to be able to share that inner core with one another so that we can become closer and more um, intimate with each other to receive strength from each other. Because strength is not about your own external power. It's about being able to be infused together with all the resources that God has for you. And part of that is being in right relationship, or is the key to that is right relationship. Righteousness refers to being in contact with each other at the very inner core. Stand with your with the gospel of peace, I think, in some translations. Basically, where you stand is going to determine what direction you're going to go. And if you aren't standing in peace with one another in relationship, the relationship's not going to go anywhere. So there needs to be a, a basis of peace in that. And it talks about the, the place of peace is the message of the gospel. And to me, the biggest message of the gospel is forgiveness. So what it's talking about, I believe, or Paul is kind of alluding to here, is in order to have a good relationship with God and with yourself, you need to understand the nature of forgiveness between you and God, but how that, that same forgiveness is lived out in your relationship with one another. Because they're one and the same. The gospel is not just vertical, it's horizontal. And so if, if we don't understand that God doesn't just save us for us to escape hell, that God saves us, that we can be reconciled to everything that he wanted and intended, then we're missing it. And we aren't really, truly being able to experience what Laura kind of alluded to. See, the, the lie of the enemy is that somehow by becoming stronger individually, you're going to experience more freedom. And what the Bible is basically saying, I believe, is the more you can be related in, in good relationship with God and with each other, you're gonna find more freedom than, than you could ever imagine. Because we were never meant to live alone. And we were meant to have, when something goes wrong, to have people, safe people around us, to know that they're there with us, they're gonna stand with us. When we're having a, a, a wonderful, joyful time, don't you wanna tell somebody? Don't you want somebody to be able to rejoice with you? because that increases the joy. And so all of this has to do with relationship, I believe. And these last four pieces really emphasize it, I think. Faith of a shield, okay? In those days, a shield was designed as protection. But if you're just standing out there with your shield all by yourself, you have protection probably in one direction, right? But if you have other people around you with these shields and you're all standing together, you've got protection all around. And so faith is meant to be shared with one another. And so this shield of faith, I believe, is there are going to be times when we don't have the faith to face something. But just like in that story that Jesus told about the, the uh, four friends who brought their paralytic friend to Jesus and Jesus healed the paralytic, Jesus' statement was he looked at their faith, their friend's faith, not the paralytic's faith, but the friend's faith. And I believe that's an example of the shield of faith, that we share one another's faith. When, when I don't have enough faith, I can borrow from other people, and they can share it with me, and we can then face the enemy together. The helmet of salvation. 
Salvation to me represents hope. And we have to, uh, and part of a healthy relationship is to be able to, to see that relationship through the thinking of hope, through the worldview of hope, through the paradigm of hope. Because if you are viewing your relationship as this is just going to get bad, it's hopeless, right? It's just going to get worse. Then that's the way it's going to go. Because the way you, you view it is, is going to determine the way in which you operate. And the helmet of salvation is where we can help one another keep our minds set in the, in the right direction. And we can have each other to point out, well, maybe it's not as hopeless as you think. Look at this. Or we can wait and know that God will give us hope and we can stand together in that hope. So the helmet, that's the helmet. And the last, or second to last really, is the word of God. And it talks about being a sword, right? If you are not, uh, when you're fighting and you're just looking at the sword by yourself, then you could be missing all kinds of other things around you that maybe that sword needs to, to go after. And so in the, to me, uh, it's important to study scripture individually, but I believe when you study scripture, you need to come together with other people to make sure that the way you're handling that scripture is truly the way it, or has all the fullness that God would intend. Because we aren't to, to just come up uh, in my apologetic class, they told me the worst theology comes when it's just one person. And that's why most of the heresies are named after one person. And so that's where it falls apart when you don't involve other people and you don't check each other. And finally, it begins with prayer. That we have to be, it, Paul says, uh, that we pray passionately in the spirit, right? And as you intercede with every form of prayer. So prayer is not just about us praying to God. It's about us praying to God for other people, with other people, and to be able to, to combine our resources and our people. Because God sees us as part of a family, as part of a unit. And so he's not, he's, he cares about the individual pieces, but he also cares about how the unit as a whole is moving. And if the unit as a whole is not moving well, then that's what he's going to go after. Because he knows that the, whole, the unit as a whole is suffering. And so he, he wants the best. So I'm not saying all your teaching on individual pieces for individuals is wrong. I'm saying perhaps there's a way to expand it and to see that uh, perhaps we've been influenced by Western thinking about coming up to be a strong individual is the goal of life. Well, I believe the goal of life that God has for us is to become a full individual which Jesus defined as not living for yourself, but living for others. And so that would include that kind of relationship. Thank you, Stan. That was, um, I think whenever, you're right, like whenever I read this passage, even just by myself, I would imagine, okay, I need to put the armor on, but it's really all of us putting on our armor together and standing shoulder to shoulder. Like we're not in this war alone, but we're, we're in it together that and, and even like I, I bought this book by accident <laughs> it's a long story but you know I'm a boomer <laughs> so I bought this book by Dr. Bruce, Bruce Perry by accident and it's called what happened to you and it's amazing because I know God's our creator and this is how he created us but when research kind of backs it up you're like oh you know this is real like God really this affirms you know who God is and how he works but the research there's all kinds of research that shows but he says um he says this, connectedness has the power to counterbalance adversity. And that's, 
that's exactly what you know the Bible is teaching, you know, Paul is teaching in that um, when he goes on, but like, and all the research shows us, but people who are connected, like they experience less stress, even in the midst of adversity, they have better healing, they have healthier behaviors, um, they have a greater sense of purpose in their life, and they live longer, like a physically, they live longer. And so it's, it's so, this is all the, the things that God desires for us in our life. And so I love that. And, and so, again, our desire for interdependence, it has to be stronger than our desire for independence. And, and, and I think when we talk about interdependence, we're talking about mutual inter interdependence where we, we help one another. And, and not just, and this happens sometimes, like one person is usually the helper and one person is really good at receiving the help. Like with my older brother and sister, um, I will take from them all day long, and they will give to me. But for my younger brother, I help him, and he takes. And he takes everything. No, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's not um, – it's it's a mutual give and receive. And um, we know people who like to give a lot. I know leaders like to give a lot, and it's really hard to receive help or anything. And, but um, we really come from a culture that um, we're giving and receiving is transactional. So, like, if um, – if Stan took me out to lunch, then I'd be like, oh, okay, next time I'll take him out to lunch, right? It has to be even and it has to be fair and, and equal. But like God's mutual interdependence and that um, relationship and that connection, and it really is how we are changed and how we are transformed, how we experience that healing. And, and so um, it's, it's, it's interesting that it's, yeah, it's more transformational. And it's how we become more loving and healthy. And so this week we were thinking, um, you know, in terms of application, to really think and ask ourselves, like, am I more generally more the person who likes to give? Am I the giver? Or am I one that likes to receive? And then maybe where we resist. Where do we resist? Um, you know, do we resist receiving help or do we resist giving help? And, and why? So those two questions. And then um, maybe you're like, I know the reason why, and but maybe we just need to practice. And so I was thinking, you know, if that's you, maybe you could practice a couple times a week. Like, okay, I'm going to um, ask someone, you know, maybe I'm struggling with something, I'm going to ask someone to go out and have coffee with me. Or, you know, maybe I'm, I have an issue with my car and I don't know what to do. Maybe I'll ask someone to give me advice or to come over and look at my car or maybe I'll ask someone to pray for me or maybe I'll go to the prayer table after church today and ask for prayer or if it's you know something where maybe you um you have trouble giving to others you can practice a couple times this week you know asking anybody hey do you need any help maybe they're sharing and you're like oh can I help you with that or oh you're going to the airport don't take lifts you know let me give you a ride let me help you out but you know we can just do those little things to help us build up our muscles, because we got to go to war on the big things too. So um, it's a way for us to help us remember that our our desire for interdependence it has to be stronger than than dependence. So um, Stan, can you share with us some of your? Those are my thoughts. Can you share some of your closing? <laughs> well, uh, this morning in pre-service, uh, someone mentioned that. Uh, it's the, as I talk about this, it's like a team of football team and you have people who have different roles and uh, sometimes we tend to think that we're all supposed to be the one carrying the ball or uh, we're the one who's supposed to be having the ball pass too. And uh, those uh, skill positions supposedly called skill positions are important. But if you don't have an offensive line to uh, protect the quarterback who passes, or if you don't have an offensive line that holds, that allows the quarterback to hold the ball long enough for the receiver to break open, the play doesn't work. The timing doesn't work. And so the offensive line is basically a bunch of guys who are willing to be hit. And uh, they don't 
get any real glory uh, because uh, except after the play is done, they, they may focus on them. But during the play, nobody's watching them. They're watching the, the quarterback or they're watching the receivers. And, and so in our interdependence, we need to see that a lot of that is hidden. And it's not necessarily where it's going to be blatant and obvious, but it's going to be things that we know are necessary. And uh, I think there, the great example of that was in communion. And we're going to be partaking communion in a second here. But if you think about it, communion is two elements of what we're talking about. The first element is the breaking of the bread which is basically being willing, Jesus is saying, I'm going to show you what's inside of me. I'm going, to, I'm going to show you and also give to you part of what's inside of me. And the blood, the wine or the, the drink representing the life is that he's going to pour his life into you and into us. And we are called than to pour that life out to each other and provide life through that. And so uh, I would invite you to uh, get your elements here. And I'm going to read a passage from uh, uh, the uh, Passion. And uh, it's from 1 Corinthians uh, 11 verses 23 to 25. So what we're going to do is um, I'm going to read the passage and then I'm going to invite you to go ahead and as you feel led to partake in the elements. And the reason I, I want you to do that is to know that sometimes we don't always know when we're connecting with somebody, but we are. When we're, when we're willing to share, when we're willing to, to kind of take the hit, in my offensive line example, that we are actually providing freedom for somebody. And so as you're participating in this, may you be receiving what God has for you, and then also thinking about, as Lori mentioned, well, what, what, where in my life, God, would you want me to share? this gift with other people. Okay, so let me read 1 Corinthians 11. It says this. I have handed down to you what came to me by direct revelation from the Lord himself. The same night in which he was handed over, he took bread and gave thanks. Then he distributed it to the disciples and said, take it and eat your fill. It is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. He did the same with the cup of wine after supper and said, this cup seals the new covenant with my blood. Drink it. And whenever you drink this, do it to remember me. So I invite you to, to go ahead and take the wafer and drink the grape juice. So as the worship team comes up, I invite you to, to take a position, a posture, a posture of contemplation and think about as those elements went down into your body, there was also a spiritual element going into your spiritual body. And that was the blood, the, the body of Jesus and his blood. And it is designed to transform and to create a sense of freedom, a sense of letting you know that there is nothing that you can ever do that will make God not love you. So why don't we have the worship team 